Well, hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at the theologian Rudolf Bultmann. Bultmann was a contemporary of Karl Barth, and both of them are often put in the same category, being called dialectical theologians, or say crisis theologians. In fact, Boltmann wrote a very favorable review of Karl Barth's Romans commentary, and so the two are, have some similarities that should be looked at today. The first similarity that we should notice is that both of them are reacting against liberalism. This comes from their circumstances. Both of them have lived through World War I, are going into World War II, and both of them are pessimistic about the great optimism that liberalism has put out. The plight of human beings is much more disastrous and much less promising than what liberalism had thought modern Christianity would lead to. And so both of them are committed to rethinking religion in a way that will be more helpful for modern people. The second similarity is that both of them are very heavily influenced by Soren Kierkegaard. Now the very title dialectical shows a dependence on Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard had a dialectical method, and both Bart and Boltmann have found that and are using that in their own theology. Existentialism will be very important then to Boltmann as well. Now, one of the reasons for Karl Barth and Rudolf Boltmann was the fact that Kierkegaard had been translated into German in the early 20th century, just a few years before. And so theologians were now reading Kierkegaard and they had new resources for a theological method that could counter some of the optimism of liberalism that just didn't seem to work. And so Boltmann is going to be utilizing the ideas of existence, the idea of crisis that he finds in Kierkegaard, and for several years, from 1922 to 1928, he teaches with a philosopher, Martin Heidegger, who is working with Kierkegaard also. Heidegger's Being in Time, that great monumental philosophy work that was probably the most influential philosophical work of the 20th century, is influenced by Soren Kierkegaard quite heavily. And so Boltmann and Heidegger teach together in the University of Marburg, and it's those existentialist categories that have come from Kierkegaard that are worked out through Heidegger and then made into theology by Rudolf Bultmann. Now, if we're to compare Karl Barth and Rudolf Bultmann to each other, it's common to say that Karl Barth is the founder of neo-orthodoxy, and maybe that Rudolf Bultmann has developed a neoliberalism. We'll see that Bart makes a very strong break with liberal theology, while Boltmann stays within it and tries to revise it from within. For Bart, liberal theology was man talking about man in a loud voice. While thinking they were talking about God, they were talking about themselves. For Boltmann, liberal theology was on the right track, but it looked for significance in religion in the wrong place. When it went back to the historical Jesus, it looked for the message of Jesus. What was Jesus teaching all about? And it showed its significance that Jesus formed a religion. Boltmann thinks that's the wrong place to look for the significance of Jesus. In fact, it was the Christ event the cross and the resurrection that shows that we can come into contact with God himself, that God reaches down to us, reorients our life, helps us to live authentically instead of inauthentically. Boltmann thinks that's the answer, and so he's going to stick with liberal theology and revise some of it. We might note this in understanding what faith is, faith in the content of God's word. For Bart, this is a response to God's self-revelation. God makes God's self known, and then we focus on God himself. And so we're interested in knowing about God. For Boltmann, faith in the word of God really doesn't allow us to say anything about God. 
God is beyond knowing, and faith is an existential event in the life of the believer. What we can see is what reorients our existence. It's a newness of life. And so for Boltmann, that's what he wants to talk about in his theology. There are several concepts that we simply must understand if we're going to understand Boltmann's method, his demythologization, and his existentialist approach to Christianity. The first of those is pre-understanding. Now, Boltmann recognizes with hermeneutics that various interpreters will come to a text looking for different things. So what a historian is looking to find in the biblical text is going to be very different from what a literary critic is looking to find in the biblical text. That's going to be very different from what a believer is looking to find in the biblical text. Each are looking for something a bit different. Boltmann thinks that's fine. But he says, if we're going to approach the scriptures religiously, then existentialism provides the best resources for us to be able to show how a human being comes to the text. Because the text is asking ultimate questions for life. And those same issues are the ones that we face today, that human beings have faced in every age. And so there's something of a fusion of horizons between the biblical text and the common interpreter today. The second important issue for Boltmann is the distinction between what he calls history and what he calls Geschichte. These are German terms. I'll simply use the English um, translation of them, which means outer history and inner history. We could say that's probably the best way to get at it. Boltmann recognizes that there is a certain way of going about history that looks for facts. And there's a certain way of looking at history that reads history for its meaning for my life today. And those two things are very different. So with history, that is the outer history, what we could call the facts, it's the activity of scientific history as it reconstructs the past. This is what a professional historian might do to try to get at what happened back then. It's concerned with dates and places and documents and battles and personalities and social and economic forces. If you had a boring history class, this is the way they taught it, looking at facts, making you memorize facts in history. But there's another dimension of historical interest, and that is Geschichte, that is inner history. It's that dimension of the same history which challenges and transforms human existence. It's those same events, but now they mean something important for my life. Let's take an example. I'm living at someone's home right now who is in a nursing home. For me, when I see piles of things, and particularly pictures and knickknacks, they're just junk to me. I don't understand what those things are, but I dare not get rid of them because for that person, they are treasures, they're memories. There are important things collected over the years. For me, it's history, it's outer history, it's just facts, it's just things. For that person, it's Geschichte, it's inner history, it's important life events that are remembered and preserved through those things. Let's use a different example. Let's talk about the cross. If a historian very disinterestedly is to put out the facts as can be known. The cross was an event in history in which a person was killed. Many such events have happened in history. But when a believer looks at the event of the cross, and this is what Boltman is getting at, that believer sees something different. He sees the opportunity for authentic existence. He sees a way of life a radical reorientation to the way the world works that's offered by God to him. And so that reader gets something much different out of those same facts. For Boltmann, God always acts in Geschichte, in that inner history, in the events with significance. Now, the last part that is important to Boltmann here is what we might call content criticism. 
For Boltmann, we need to distinguish between what is essential in an author's thought and those things that aren't very essential in an author's thought. Paul may talk about numerous things in his letters. Certain things are essential to him. The gospel is essential to him. But some of the other prescriptions and the other things he talks about may be less important. They may be changeable. And it's important then that we understand the essence of Paul's message, the essence of it for all time, that essential part that Paul is talking about, that we preserve that and then marginalize the rest of it. This is going to be very important when we get to demythologizing because Boltmann will want to utilize content criticism, preserve the important part, reinterpret the important part, and then strip off some of the mythology. Now to understand Boltmann as a theologian, we have to understand him in relation to Martin Heidegger. The two were on faculty together at the University of Marburg from 1922 to 1928. And this was a great opportunity for both of them to teach together and to collaborate together. What happened is that Heidegger's philosophy was utilized by Rudolf Bultmann in a way that Bultmann was able to translate it into theological categories. For Martin Heidegger, there are two categories of existence. There are authentic people and there are inauthentic people. There are some people who determine the significance of their own lives. They recognize that they're finite, they're going to die, and they live with purpose as they live each moment of their lives. They make decisions for themselves. They decide what they want to be. And then there's most people who simply go with the crowd. They're inauthentic. They just live for whatever is going on at the moment. Rudolf Bultmann sees in that tremendous theological significance because he sees two ways of life being contrasted, especially in Paul. There's the way of life that's prior to faith, that Romans 7 kind of life in which I just kind of do what happens. I don't know what I am doing. I wish that I weren't doing sometimes what I'm doing, but I just kind of go along with it and I feel pulled in a certain direction. That's inauthentic living for Boltmann. And then there's the life under faith, the Romans 8 kind of life. That life of freedom in which I'm able to take control of my own possibilities, where I'm able to be in relationship with something greater than myself. That's God for Boltmann. And so there's two ways of life being contrasted here. Boltmann also draws a distinction between justification by works, trying to earn my own way before God, me being in control of myself. That's an inauthentic kind of life. That's the natural way. And then there's the life of faith in which we submit ourselves to God, live freely in him, and it's through that that we experience authenticity. That's the way that Boltmann is utilizing Heidegger's categories, and it's very helpful then when we move on to understand Boltmann's theology. Now, if we're going to understand how Boltmann suggests that we go about demythologizing the text of the New Testament, it's important that we understand what he means by myth. To make sure that I'm representing him rightly, I simply give quotes on this page, and I'm simply going to read them and then explain them a bit. So for Boltmann, the real purpose of myth is not to present an objective picture of the world as it is, but to express man's understanding of himself in the world in which he lives. Let's take for an example that Christian myth, as Boltmann would say it is, of Adam and Eve in the garden eating the forbidden fruit. Now this story has many layers of meaning here, far from being untrue, that's often the way we think of myth today, far from being untrue, this story is very, very true. It gets at a kind of reality that is deeper than what could be stated in propositions. There's a great amount of meaning in the story that needs to be drawn out and explained, and it can be explained in many ways that are all true. Boltmann adds another insight here that's very important, I think. Myth is an expression of man's conviction that the origin and purpose of the world in which he lives are to be sought not within it, but beyond it. 
that is beyond the realm of known and tangible reality, and that this realm is perpetually dominated and menaced by those mysterious powers which are at its source and limit. Myth is also an expression of man's awareness that he is not lord of his own being. Myth is told, Boltmann thinks, because we're in touch with the reality that there's something greater out there, that we're not in control of ourselves, that there is more to reality there than we can get. So Boltmann says the real question is whether this understanding of existence is true. Faith, he says, claims it is. There is more to reality than what we can control. We are not the masters of our own destiny. There's something beyond us. That something is God, and we do relate to him. We do find our purpose in him. Faith claims that it is, and faith ought not to be tied down to any imagery of New Testament mythology. And as a result, myth needs to be demythologized so that the truth of that myth can come out. This is not eliminating the myth, rather it's interpreting the myth so that the significance of the myth can be brought into a modern era. Now, why do we need to demythologize today? Quite simply, because we don't live in the same world as the New Testament authors did. We don't think the same way as ancient people do. And so we need to translate the message of the New Testament into something that can be understood today. That mythical world simply isn't credible to modern persons. Now, here's a great quote from Boltmann. He says, it's impossible to use electric light and the wireless and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries, and at the same time to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. He thinks that's simply uncredible to our modern scientific age. Now, Boltmann says that liberals had a good idea here. They were trying to work with myth and get at what was real behind it, but they did it in the wrong way, and so liberalism failed. What they tried to do was to strip off myth and find behind it an ethical message of Jesus. We can just strip off all the miracles. What we find are moral, ethical messages for today. Boltman said that was the wrong solution. So they stripped it off, they got rid of the myth, and along with it, they got rid of the reality of the New Testament, and so their liberal theology failed. Instead, Boltmann says, what's going on in these myths is a call to authentic existence. Through existentialist philosophy, he's found the categories to talk about what's going on in the New Testament. There's an invitation to authenticity going on here. It's a call to submit ourselves to God and move from being sinners, selfish individuals who try to control our own destiny, to having faith and resting peacefully in the life of God. So what Boltmann thinks he's doing is removing a false stumbling block so that people can really see the true stumbling block and can stumble over that and decide if they want to be authentic persons. The central goal for Boltmann is to get to kerygma, message or preaching or that, that authentic offer by God where it can be experienced by the individual. So the center of the Christian message when it's demythologized basically for Boltmann is this. It's to be open to God's future, which is really imminent for every one of us. To be prepared for this future, which can come as a thief in the night when we do not expect it. To be prepared because this will be a judgment on all men that have bound themselves to this world and are not free, not open to God's future. And so Boltmann thinks that he's liberating us from New Testament myth and that he's opening us to kerygma so that the message of the gospel can be heard today in terms relevant to modern hearers.